And we're live. Huawei continues to face problems in the U.S. market, but to date, no one's been sharing any evidence of security threats. OnePlus 6 rumors are pointing to a higher price tag than many fans might be happy with, and Verizon continues to push some buttons, this time for iPhone users. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 297 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded March 23rd at noon Pacific, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, contributing editor at PocketNow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong on the East Coast. How's it going, sir? Hello there. It's going just fine for a Friday. I'm feeling just as good about anything for the weekend, and uh, hopefully you are too. Yeah, we're living for the weekend. <laughs> Anytime the weekend's yeah. happening, it's just it's just fine. It's okay. The weather's decent, and and we can make the most of our short lives on this. You heard it here first, folks. The weekend <laughs> is fine by us. We're fine with the weekend. I uh, know some really cool stories coming up uh, this uh, this podcast, uh, all the top news from pocketnow.com. I'm going to say let's jump straight into some of the, the housekeeping stuff that we need to get to. Uh, if you'd like to join the conversation, you can, of course, uh, tweet at us during the live broadcast using the hashtag PN Weekly. Uh, that's the easiest way for us to catch your comments and add them to the discussion. We love all the people in the live chat. We do check in on the live chat, but often uh, it's hard for us to keep up with uh, conversations that are happening there. And of course, if you're a fan of the uh, the more traditional uh, methods of digital online communications, you can also hit us an email if you're listening to this show after the live broadcast. And you can hit us up at podcast at pocketnow.com, where we collect all of your questions and we use that as a uh, fodder for mailbag and listener take the wheel episodes we try and produce at the end of each month so uh jules you've got the you've got a crazy list for our rundown this week yeah, uh, i do let's, let's jump into the top headlines from pocketnow.com indeed so uh for the week of march 19 2018 this is all the mobile tech news that is fit to podcast there are conflicting views to how many new model iphones Apple will be able to sell from this September. Taiwanese industry sources say that Apple has ordered at least 110 million OLED displays and 70 million LCD displays. Korean sources say that only 50 million OLED displays will be had and 150 million LCDs gotten. It's believed that two OLED iPhone variants will be priced well and above one LCD model. Meantime, Apple, Facebook, and Google are all reported to be pursuing a buyout of image startup Lytro, best known for its light field cameras. TechCrunch reports that for Google's part, it will pay between $25 and $40 million for an asset acquisition as opposed to a corporal one. The big reason why it's the favorite horse to win, Google Hardware SVP Rick Osterloh is on Lytro's board of directors. We shall see what happens with this one. Corporate presentation slide supposedly dug up from OnePlus headquarters has detailed the OnePlus 6 to have top-line specifications, including up to 256 gigabytes of storage. Other specs since dug up include a 20-megapixel selfie camera. The price for a meaty thing like this, supposedly, $749, surpassing the max spec OnePlus 5T of just a few months ago by nearly $200. We'll have to see uh, what we can dig into on that one because uh, there's been some reporting going on here. Uh, more on that a little bit later. Qualcomm's lead man on display tech, Salman Saeed, spoke with Tech Radar about the likelihood of foldable smartphones coming soon. The short answer is near zero. And the reason? Display transistors still can't survive an expected lifetime of bending and stretching, and that has plenty of manufacturers still working on the case, at least for the years to come. The My Verizon app has pushed out a notification urging people to buy the Galaxy S9 through the carrier. Thing is, iPhone and iPad customers got this message too, and Apple doesn't seem to be 
well, it, it just feels it, it doesn't need to do anything about this. Doesn't seem to be enforcing its own rules against direct marketing through push notifications. Other apps like uh, AliExpress have exploited this lax attitude and that has really um, dug into some developers, some iOS app developers the wrong way. One of Instagram's recent improvements to its feed has been to incorporate more up-to-date posts at the top of every refresh. There have been plenty of complaints about non-chronological uh, curation of posts on social media platforms, so this measure may address some forlorn consumers, and it's a good step, uh, hopefully, that more of these platforms will take. And finally, LG has open-sourced the code for its version of WebOS. It's the first time since HP did it after acquired Palm, and, well, obviously, LG acquired... Uh, the rights to webOS in 2014. It has long been relegated to serving as the user interface for LG smart televisions, but it has filed with a Korean regulator to explore new uses for webOS. So uh, I'm wondering with this uh, last story here, uh, what would you believe would be a good use case for uh, the webOS that we know right now? Obviously, uh, it's been used for smartwatches uh, under LG's capacity in the past, and of course with tablets and uh, smart uh, a smartphone or two back right. in the Palm Day. A, a few smartphones way back in the day. I think I still have my uh, my webOS tablet somewhere that I got from that fire sale way back when. Uh, I'm I'm kind of torn. I the the whole thing about having an operating system is about trying to build, maintain, and service an ecosystem. And I think LG has a great argument to expand their lifestyle products, their their kitchen products, their washers and dryers. I have an LG washer and dryer, and it's got this sort of like half-hearted attempt at syncing with my phone. You can kind of tap your phone on it and you get the ability to sort of control things on the washer and dryer. I think that could be LG's direct directly. I think uh, WebOS could be LG's killer, uh, killer app, if you will, um, tying together the products that they already have. Um, kind of like the way that Samsung has Tizen as a way that they can fall back on in-house development to, to build an ecosystem of products for their specific customers. I think that makes the most sense. I'm not entirely sure what we could or should hope for from WebOS as an open source initiative. I'm I'm not sure who's who who would stand to benefit from playing in an OS space that has a lot of potential, but products don't really get sold by potential. You kind of need to to put up or shut up. And there are so ultimately, many good ideas. It, yeah. Um, there, ultimately, sorry, just to yeah. wrap up, there's so many good ideas. Like I would love to see WebOS as like an in car unit. You know, instead of a proprietary in dash unit, which has terrible software, um, like I hate using anything that has to do with the touch screen on my Nissan. Um, that that I think could could go a long ways towards improving some of the condi conditions when we're interacting with technology in the car. But I, I'm not sure who's really going to take that ball and run with it, uh, given all of the different options and major competition from platforms like iOS and Android. And ultimately, it's going to be LG's uh, sandbox that these developers will end up playing in. Uh, now they get to maybe set up standards, documentation, and other little bug fixes and tweaks. So that's kind of LG's way of uh, deferring costs over to uh, people with passion, I guess you could say. <laughs> but um, we, I mean, we see little illustrations and drawings, and of course the the floating out there, the notion that it could be going back to smartwatches or to laptops or to refrigerators, just like as you said, Tizen. Uh, it's, but why wasn't this done years ago? When or just or why wasn't there a more thoughtful approach to WebOS when uh, it you know was just new, was fresher? Uh, in LG's hands, and why hasn't it, well, it I skipped mean, out I, on the think Q AI kind of thing yeah, that they have? I, 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 I get what you're saying, and, and especially given the success that Samsung has had in developing their own operating system, uh, or and actually operating systems, the different flavors and variants of in-house development that power TVs versus uh, 
what is it, Curator, their smart assistant for their washer and dryers, which is different than Bixby, which is different than Tizen. Um, I, I think one of the things that held LG back was the amount of time WebOS spent in that weird holding pattern as HP was finally drowning it for the last possible time. And so whatever outside developer support there could have been had to be completely separated from how server driven WebOS was. How many how many pieces of proprietary code and patented licensed tech, the APIs that were involved in WebOS for it to be even the moderately successful, the minorly successful smartphone operating system that it was. And I think once LG got its hands on the core guts of this of this very different animal than when it was with HP and certainly than when it was with Palm, I think it took them time to sort of unravel what it was they could do with it. And and also, I, 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 don't, I don't mean this to sound as snarky as it's going to, but I also don't have the most faith in LG software developers um, for consistently iterating, being focused on tasks, on projects, having an end goal in mind in the same way that I think we've come to expect from an outlet like Samsung, um, especially once you start playing with uh, the newest gear smartwatches. Andrew Wallace sharing photos of his gear watch because he moved from Android Wear over to Tizen on uh, on Twitter. He uh, hooked us up on the uh, PN Weekly hashtag. Uh, we, we've come to have different expectations for these companies and what they can execute. LG, I think, kind of floundered with this new property for a while before they kind of got the guts of it under control and started iterating for TVs. Outside of TVs, what else can you do with it? And I'm not sure they have a plan in mind for that. That's why I think we're hearing no, no, more noise on this open source initiative. I think kind of hoping to spur on some outside tinkerer or uh, sort of part-time developer imagination. You know, if someone else can come in and do something disruptive or interesting or fun with it, and it's open source and LG can borrow from, from that experience, then maybe they'll have more potential for a consumer facing product that they can make money off of in the next couple of years. I don't necessarily want to buy one, but what I do want to get my hands on is uh, LG watch Urbane, which was the first yeah. modern uh, smartwatch back in 2015 with LTE of all things. Yeah. And it had the freaking uh, web OS little thing. I didn't like it. It, it, was, it looked it, a little cute. It was like, it was a like making attempt at, you know, at the still burgeoning kind of, um, uh, you know, circular smartwatch thing going on there, as which in, but you know, I would like to know if you, did you hold it? Uh, so, so I actually, not only did I get to play with that, I did a, a survey where they did this whole sit down interview and it took like two hours uh, going through different UI elements and different button configurations and different dial configurations. And LG had some phenomenal ideas that were really well ahead of the curve. I mean, stuff that we we see executed well on Gear S2 and Gear S3 smartwatches, LG was arriving at some very similar conclusions for what a round face smart interface should resemble if we're gonna pack that thing with almost as much functionality as a phone. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that experience and unfortunately it kind of came to nothing. And then I think they just got a little gun shy and they, they, they went with the easier path which I think was ultimately the wrong move for LG, but going with Android Wear. Um, if, if they had stuck to an end goal, even if they weren't necessarily you know, first to market with it, I think they could have made a better faith argument for why an LG watch with an LG phone could have been a great pairing and really selling the notion of, of ecosystem. And from there, you get to build off of everything. Uh, with all of the smart home commentary that's going on right now and, and energy control and thermostats and uh, smart speakers and assistants that plug into your home network. Uh, just imagine like if we had kicked that off with a wearable and then they could have come out with a speaker and then they could have added a, a smart assistant to your laundry to say, hey, you know, you're about to do laundry during peak electricity times. If you wait, you can, you know, not only minimize your impact on the grid, but you can save a little cash off, you know, different rates for electricity in your area. I mean, those kinds of things could go really far for selling LG as that primary competitor for your entire lifestyle of products opposite Samsung. It's just, 
there's such a big company, there's such a big ship getting those individual departments to focus on end goals and collaborating together just doesn't seem to be something that any company can can really properly exe execute over the long run. And the right roots weren't placed at the right time, just because uh, you mentioned uh, the HP Palm kind of uh, clearing out the servers, and that left some verticals inaccessible to oh, LG yeah. at the time. And there was also like the freaking uh, there was more pressure with uh, Android with Google, uh, because that was a uh, back with stage fright, and Google wanted to say, okay, let's uh, get some more security updates out there. It was just a general kind of inserting more standards into it like because at the at it was at the time that there were talks about samsung and huawei going their own with uh tizen and uh freaking what's the, the emui that's right so right. like there was there were pressures there so eh. well and we still see flavors it was that, just you know whether or not you're looking at sort of a stock experience or uh like a like an outlet like tick watch you know, TickWatch okay. having a very highly customized build of Android on their first watch, just completely walking yeah. away from that kind of development for the uh, their follow up, less expensive uh, sport variant. So I, I just think LG got got caught during what was an exciting explosion of new potential and then never really finalized those last couple of products that could have made it to market. And and that's a shame. But I'm hoping again, it's potential there are some really good ideas in WebOS that if they can be brought to some other kind of product line, there there is something for that software to accomplish. But again, we, we have those same conversations with every other sort of alt operating system out there uh, from from the offshoots of like Mego and Sailfish and stuff yeah. like that to, uh, um, you know, uh, again, kind of custom builds of Linux that still pop up every now and then. A Firefox. Selfish is big still... in Russia. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure we're going to see a, a ton of traction on uh, that. But, uh, you know, if WebOS could become part of the backbone of another service to motivate more wearables, like that could be something really interesting. It's just whether or not that faces you know, like a renewed interest in a Fitbit, you know, Fitbit can make a bigger mm -hmm. play for the consumer market immediately. Does LG have the fortitude to stick out WebOS as a competitor against something like a Fitbit? And I don't think they do. I was expecting to talk this much about uh, WebOS, but frankly, this is a pretty, this has been pretty fruitful. So uh, <laughs> more of this please. Thank you. Um, let's get into some meat and potatoes. They're a little bit boring, but you know, given the fact that Apple has been kind of the beacon of the mobile tech industry for the past X years and how it might be able to lead the way in terms of the markets for components and blah, 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 economic stuff. Let's talk about this uh, report here, or these reports since, um, all right. So on a, any given year, we're talking about 200 million new model iPhones uh, that are going to be get shipped and sold and whatnot. And basically here, we're talking about the splits between display technologies and therefore the price bracketing for these because we're dealing with three variants this year two sizes of oled more expensive iphones and one lcd which is supposedly going to be uh less but it, there's been also reporting that there's um that the small oled version of the iphone will cost ultimately less in parts and labor than the lcd version which Blows your mind, or like it's, there's just so much going on there. But ultimately, it's how many of these things that Apple can ship. And the Koreans, that are, or like the industry sources that we're talking about here, the Koreans say that OLED will get uh, what was this a three to one play? So 150 million to 50 million units uh, from OLED to LC or LCD to OLED. Basically, these guys are favoring OLED. And Taiwanese sources are saying, no, <laughs> I'm getting confused myself here. All right, hold on. LCD will get 150 and OLED will get 50. Uh, and Taiwanese are saying 130 to OLED and 70 to LCD. Okay. So the Taiwanese are favoring the OLED side here. And now there's some sense to be made out of that because, okay, there, you have more models and the iPhone 10 is an established thing now. So now we're going to see more of these sales pop up, more of that momentum go to OLED. 
But on the other side, they're saying, hey, look at how the iPhone 10 did. It did, it performed poorly in the market and Apple's been cutting back on parts orders for uh, iPhone 10s. And uh, it's not, it, it, so there's a reason why we can't expect too many of these OLED iPhones to be sold next year. So I'm wondering where you lay down the line on this. Like if you were to put, you know, go into Lad Brooks or something and yeah. uh, place a bet on this. Like so, so here's my guess. Um, iPhone 10 represents a very expensive branding exercise from Apple. If the iPhone 10 as a thousand dollar smartphone had grossly outperformed the iPhone 8s, then I think we would have seen some continued branding language of an iPhone XI or an iPhone 11 or an iPhone X2. It would have become a new branding platform to discuss iPhones. Well, we have no idea what these next iPhones. I mean, we have three of them for us all, my, and there's like two naming paradigms. My guess, my guess is we're going to walk back some, but not all, of the extreme design language of the iPhone 10. Um, probably, you know, still keeping uh, Face ID and removing the uh, the Touch ID, the home button, an all screen iPhone. But maybe they do something where there's just a bit more forehead and chin bezel, or they sort of normalize the design a little bit more, and we arrive at something which I'm calling, but probably won't be named, the iPhone nines. So we take the big little uh, form factor of the iPhone nine and of the iPhone 8. So you have a smaller one and a larger one, probably differences on the cameras, like there's gonna be a dual camera on the larger plus version and a single camera on the smaller one, battery capacity, et cetera. And that's, that's gonna be the iPhone moving forward. So, so the naming isn't really that important. Anyone who gets their knickers in a twist about what an iPhone is called, it's just the next iPhone. It's the iPhone 2018. And I'm assuming that we'll probably see OLEDs go into those devices. Again, being able to command premium is the top options. What is officially called the iPhone 10 will be sort of relegated as the one-off celebration of the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. And we'll move forward with a trio of devices, a uh, big little for premium options, and then some kind of follow-up to the SE, which can hopefully start to better satisfy uh, LTE developing areas and replace the original iPhone SE. So my guess would be OLEDs for the premium products, commanding you know that lobster pot higher price tag, especially considering the uh, um, the, the the sort of cost because uh, we know the margins on iPhones are usually pretty solid. Uh, I, I don't see OLEDs necessarily disrupting the uh, the the amount of profit, the profit margin that I that Apple can build into them if they can also bump up the price. Saying, "Oh, we learned so much from the iPhone 10, which was a specialty one-off iPhone, and now all iPhones are going to be built more like the 10, but we can also now that from what we've learned, we can make them less expensive than the iPhone 10, but they're still more expensive than the iPhone 8." It's going to feel like you're getting a really good deal even though it's sort of just the normal progression of how phones are made. Um, and then the iPhone SE will be the one that carries with uh, some kind of LCD for the screen just so that they can come in uh, again with the branding, the marketing and call it a lesser or a less expensive phone. So that's my guess. I think we'll see OLEDs for a big little iPhone 9 and then an LCD for an iPhone SE 2. Uh, OK, um, so. Uh, just a little bit of admin here, and I'm going to have to make a marker in my mind to note this down. But uh, for our live audience, uh, I just had to find out that the, our YouTube chat has not been on, and uh, so I had to fix that up for a quick second. So uh, if you were discouraged or if you want to tell anyone that the live chat is back on, no, we were uh, censoring you. So. No First Amendment. Yeah. Take that. <laughs> We didn't no mean to. Uh, yeah, so apologies uh, we for that. Do have a, we do have oh, a comment no, no, from... Well, oh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. No, I just needed a break. No, I was just going to say, uh, 
we do have a, a couple comments here from Peter Hayton using the PN Weekly hashtag. Do you think LCD versus OLED is such a huge deal? Given the way Apple does OLED, there isn't a huge viewing difference. Plus, I find LCD a little more color accurate. So I guess this is more related to multimedia and usage of the camera. Uh, but do you find saturated OLED a little more troublesome when dealing with specific tasks like photography? <sighs> All right. So with... <laughs> OLED and you know f photography. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't see because I because it's you know you had some <laughs> photography and media viewing and you're right. you, you're supposedly just applying all these uh, you know software tuning and you know Rec seven oh nine and whatever um, that you can put onto a screen and that's kind of what you can do uh, in terms of OLED. It's just the fact of the matter is that you can turn them off. And therefore, it'll be deeper blocks. Period. Uh, and then, oh yeah, there's the you know they can show off 16 million color million colors better because I don't know the programming is more efficient and you can whatever. Um, but in terms of you know distorting what you see or uh, when you take a picture or some, something like that, I, I'm not sure where you're getting at here. Well, I mean, there's there's different philosophies for OLEDs, and there's nothing that prevents an OLED from being very color accurate. I remember the Galaxy S7, when you switched it out of the adaptive color and the adaptive brightness modes, was actually one of the most color accurate displays that we had ever seen on a mobile device. And I don't feel like we had that same experience with the S8 and Note 8 generations of phones. Like, I've, I feel every single Samsung phone I've run into since has had a ruddier display than what we had for the S7. And so given Apple's penchant towards this is a phone for creatives, this is a phone that you come to really trust and expect Apple's flavor, you know, like the iPhone camera yeah. and the processing on the iPhone camera has not changed substantially. Uh, the biggest change was the iPhone 7 to the iPhone 8. And even that was just very minor tweaks to, to contrast to brightness and to saturation over the previous generation of uh, Apple Photos. And I think in part because that actually does help an OLED pop a little bit more. So Apple's not really pushing the boundaries into Samsung territory with the way that they do <laughs> sharpening and contrast. But uh, they wanted something that was going to be a bit more crowd pleasing than just an OLED, which might have felt dull. Like you wanted to be able to see it. So if you held an iPhone 8 Plus against an iPhone 10, you want the consumer to immediately recognize that there's some kind of difference. I, I think actually Apple's been pretty reasonable about it. We, we know that they're trying to make a crowd pleasing move. You know, it's marketing and it's and it's an emotional uh, product positioning. But I think they've gone about it in a very reasonable way. I, 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 I don't feel like you 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 can't trust an iPhone camera on an OLED screen in the way that I very much do not trust the output from a Samsung camera when viewed on a Samsung display on, on that phone screen, when that phone screen is in its most automatic color shifting, crowd pleasing, color saturated mode. Um, once you once you disable that, I feel you get a much better representation of what that photo is going to look like on another display. But I think Samsung is going out of their way to make the output from their camera look as lush as possible on their screen. And that's not always reflective of what that photo really resembles. Um, so, I mean, especially opposite things like, uh, like when we saw the pixel, some of the pixel controversies on OLED, uh, P OLED and LCD and people complaining that maybe it was a bit too plain. I think that there was a better argument to be had that Google just didn't really focus on trying to impress at that emotional, you know, primate level of what's the cr prettiest, juiciest, luscious color representation that we can deliver. And that actually rubbed people the wrong way. You know, we saw all those apps and all of those mods to try and crank the uh, the screens on Pixel 2. Pixel 2 is just shooting in raw mode all the time. Everything's raw. Or, or I mean, but also I mean, like displaying that. And there's there's a reason why, you know, 
you you don't you don't show a client a raw photo. You always no. touch it up because you you can't expect anyone to have that little bit of imagination that the final output will be better than uh, than the actual raw capture. You just need all that info to do the editing. Uh, we've got from uh, Das Otter on Twitter. Will the other OEMs get left behind by the race to OLED by the big guys? And also, will LG ever catch up with Samsung with their OLED quality? Hashtag it's like that, weekly. you know, Apple has like we've been doing the reporting this week that Apple is like two years ahead of everyone else in terms of true depth and the the freaking the vertical oscillating whatever the heck kind of latest la the parts that you need for a camera system such as true depth um, depth analysis and whatever the heck like that that's that's a big advantage that they have in terms of the supply chain in terms of. Uh, R and D and just being able to you know make that happen in a, in a reasonable space. Um, with OLED, it's a little bit it's changing now. We're in the early stages. Samsung is still uh, kind of the the market leader for this, uh, but even now because of the performance of the iPhone 10, and you know they're getting told that they have to cut orders, they have to cut production. There could be a little bit more room for other OEMs to snatch in, take up yeah, uh, more stock. Man manufacturing lines. There's just yeah, yeah, yeah. They're able to take up stock and you know just use it on their phones now at the last minute or something like that. So, yeah, I mean it's possible. It's possible. So, and as for LG, I mean, I, I, I have not suffered using a PO LED on the LG V30. And, and I, I know there have been examples of people that have had wildly inconsistent backlighting or uh, some really bad uh, banding on gradient colors. I have not shared those concerns. So when I look at LG from a manufacturing standpoint, I really don't feel that it's the best example of an LG P OLED versus a Samsung AMOLED is really that far behind. I would say the quality of display is probably just above what we had on the Galaxy S6. So they're about a generation and a half to two generations behind, but I still find that those displays are eminently usable and they look fine. The biggest issue I think facing LG is fulfilling demand while also making sure their QA is up to the strictest standards. And, and I think that's a tough call for any company to, to iterate at scale from all of the other uh, like, you know, if Apple jumps into LG as a PO led supplier, you know, you're going to have a significant amount of demand that you have to fulfill and you can't be dumping a ton of displays out if they have minor defects. And that's not a good place for LG to be. It's getting those lines up to a quality and a consistency that consumers can rely on. Yeah. A uh, simulator guy says on YouTube, uh, thank you, man. Speak the truth. Some people just don't understand what Samsung does. And a couple of people talking about their Pixel XL, Pixel 2 XL, um, excuse me, uh, just uh, their screens are okay. So um, definitely a lot of greens going on and we'll look to have more of your feedback as we go along this show. Um, let's uh, head over into uh, one of our big stories this week, which is yeah. Lytro. Speaking of the freaking uh, face ID, true depth and whatever the heck, <laughs> um, that's just one of the possibilities that I floated out there that uh, some other people floated out there. But we're talking about Google here, which is expanding its own efforts into phone making, but it also has a ton of other pies that uh, it has its fingers in. So uh, it could be that, you know, there again, this would be something like a Lenovo, or, or no, um, a Motorola, that's right. That, that was the company that they bought, uh, where there was just a lot of assets shelling, a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking up some of the IP here. So it sounds like what we're going for is that with Lytro. So, um, the, I guess, talk about what you have in terms of Lytro, in terms of what you've been able to suss out uh, with its products, if you've ever interacted with them at all. Yeah, so my experiences with Lytro have been very, very minimal. I, I did get to play with the very original sort of rectangular Lytro camera. I've, I've not played with any of their newer gear. Actually, if you can uh, show it back on the screen, oh, yeah. um, which is... a. So, so this, this guy right here. So I, I've I've spent literally minutes playing around with one of these, and uh, again, there there was a a really exciting novelty to what they were trying to accomplish with this camera. Uh, you know, focusing after the fact, depth tracking, and and being able to display 
photography in a digital space in a way that we'd never seen before. Really interesting ideas. Um, but also something that at that time was a, was an idea that numerous other companies were also playing with. So, I, I mean, if you remember, we used to have apps on Lumia cameras that would allow a Lumia camera to take multiple exposures throughout the focusing range of the camera so that then you could refocus. I think the actual name of the app was refocus. Um, is you could refocus your photo after you took it. So you could say, you know, like, oh, I took this photo and it pulsed through all of it. You just had to hold still for a second. I'm kind of surprised that Google would be making such a, a strong play, uh, according to these, these, these rumors, this insider info, for a company like Lytro, where I kind of feel that a Pixel camera is already demonstrating a number of the properties that would make a Lytro camera system successful where the Pixel 2 camera is, is very adept at taking ext an extreme number of exposures to uh, help improve low light clarity, to help re reduce noise, uh, to, to make sure that your exposures are really nice and crisp and contrasty. Uh, Google's software approach to processing all of that information is already pretty formidable. So I'd be curious to see what assets Google thinks it might need from a company like Lytro. I mean, we'll never get the full scoop on that. We'll never get the full answer, but that's absolutely the fly on the wall conversation that I'd like to hear because I kind of feel we're already well into software, photo and video processing tech that could rival what the hardware on a Lytro could do. I don't think that's any extreme hurdle to get over. So what is it that we're lacking for some of these other fun features or refocusing features or depth tracking? Um, if, if Google's answer to dual camera systems was a single lens on the pixel, that software could determine the depth between your subject and your background, then what do we have left to figure out? I kind of feel like that pie has been baked. We've solved that problem. Hmm. Well, uh, what was it? One of the, um, like sideline features of the original Lytro cameras, the uh, perspective shift, like you could change it a little bit just by from the data that it was able to acquire from the light vectors that it was able to capture. I don't, I don't remember, honestly, I, for, for when I, I mean, I got to play with the Lytro when this was brand spanking new. And the big thing we were all flipping out about was this like one button press for refocusing and, uh, uh, changing the, the focus of your shot after the fact. And so all of these like very limited website plugins that you could use to, to embed a Lytro photo so that people could interact with that photo. And from there, I, I didn't really keep up with what new developments or what new ideas they were trying to front. Um, it just never really seemed to me to be, it, it, it always seemed to just sort of fall into that novelty, but not something that I felt had, it, 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 I didn't feel it was some burning problem that consumers were having that they could solve by buying this piece of hardware. Um, there's there's a part of me that you know gets a little snarky about you know if you're having issues with your photos not being in focus, well get better <laughs> taking photos and your photos will be in focus and they're easier to share than these sort of digital constructs that people sort of have to interact with. It's a little like 360 video. There aren't a lot of people who like interacting with 360 right now. Uh, you know, it's like, just point the camera at what you want to show me, as opposed to giving the viewer the freedom to explore the whole frame is often seen as a burden, not a perk. Um, and, and I kind of always had that same feeling with Lytro. What is it that you took a picture of? Why didn't you just take a picture of that and show me that picture? Why, why do I have to click around in your photo just for the novelty of refocusing on different parts of your frame? And I guess that was part of the consumer uh, detraction to that that made them or, you know, naturally directed Lytro into more of the cinematography uh, field, the high resolution field and the growth of the equipment itself. But you know, when we're talking about you know, the basics of it all, I mean, it's just a few components that may or may not be able to circumvent the current parts crunch uh, that we're talking about for depth tracking uh, technologies such as Face ID and whatnot. So, it, and, it, you know, to what precision, to what, what level of, uh, like, micrometers that we're able to, <laughs> you know, right. be able to pick up on these things. It, you know, there's lots of potential, uh, lots of high-precision stuff that we may be able to talk about in terms of uh, depth tracking and, well, and uh, augmented reality. So who knows? 
and in, even outside of the high precision stuff, you, we we can get as as tech fans, we can get up our own butts about how much we care about certain thresholds, professional level thresholds, scientific level thresholds. But I look at a pixel and I, I don't think Google is wrong in having a consumer grade approach to solving some of these problems that's way more reliant on software than on high precision hardware. Um, I, I'll be very curious to see what the outcome of an acquisition, especially an asset acquisition, not a team acquisition. They're not even pulling over members from what it sounds like, not even like what HTC is going through and giving uh, some of their top talent over to Google. Uh, I, I'll be very it's curious. It's not as if HTC has hardware to freaking give away. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what, the, what they've got in the pipeline hasn't been the most inspiring uh, from what we've seen. Um, so I, I, I'll be, I'll be really interested to see because Google's conversation on the pixel two was we can do depth of field blur as good, or maybe even better than phones with dual camera systems that provide us some of this better binocular depth information and what consumer benefit would we have even from a security standpoint to utilizing more hardware on the front face of your phone to do something like a face unlock. Uh, I'll, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I, I'm just saying I'll be curious to see, does that really move the needle or change the conversation? I think consumers are really well served right now. And I don't see where something like that's going to spark much imagination other than just to make people who own the Pixel 2 feel like they got an inferior product that's not as secure. You know, that's a really delicate conversation to have, which I think Apple has been stumbling with lately, too, is every new iPhone that comes out. Well, your last iPhone is garbage now. <laughs> You're like, that's that's not a good way to make your consumers feel good about investing in your product over time. Uh, if you sold us on software processing, being able to hang just as well with hardware, and then the next pixel that comes out is all about, oh, look at how much better this hardware is. I, I don't feel good <laughs> about the pixel equals ecosystem long term, if that's the kind of chat you're going to have. It's kind of like the headphone jack. Oh, we have a headphone jack. And now we don't. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the, the, what, what good was that text on that advertisement, huh? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll get to that when we deal with it, I guess. So eventually, things will have to come around. But until then, I am uh, quickly trying to edit in a picture here that I apparently forgot to add on this post about the OnePlus 6, uh, showing the, the freaking leaked freaking... Um, slide thing whatever oh, the yeah, hot thing in china that. yeah right the, the hot thing in china is that you know you gotta you gotta have a slide you have to have a blurry picture of the slide at the right. internal corporate presentation well i mean while, and, you, while, you, you know, while you're doing that i mean we can we can no, yeah, no, I, the... well yeah but no i'm telling you to refresh now because it's there now <laughs> it's, oh, it's gotcha, great gotcha. let me uh let me so. let me see if i can get that ah oh, there it is so yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah 16 20 megapixel yeah. things at the back uh quick charging whatever um uh, but it's the combination of eight gigs of ram and 256 gigs uh, storage with the snapdragon 845 and uh, you know it's somewhat a uh, i don't know how to say if it's reasonable if it's priced at 749. now the thing is is that uh for context this is china we're talking about presumably yeah. because the iPhone 10 is listed here with a $1,500 price tag, and the Galaxy S9 Plus is $1,200. Uh, but that's because there are import taxes for, and OnePlus is a domestic manufacturer in China, so right. they'd have to, you know, and the fact is, is that the OnePlus 5T was priced pretty much at parity in both China and the U.S. Mm -hmm. So that leaves me to believe that if this slide it holds true that we should really expect a one plus six max spec at what 190 dollars above the max spec one plus 5t which is the biggest step yet in terms yeah, of no that's this a huge step that's not remodeling that's yeah this remodeling of one plus into a, you know from a tech enthusiast uh budget for value kind of uh player into whatever the heck it, it aspires to be 
Well, and I think we do know what it aspires to be. I think the the more recent changes have been trying to get out of just being the limited sweetheart brand for Android enthusiasts and trying to find some kind of audience mass market. And there are a lot of lessons that you can learn from other companies, but I think there's been a general trend where these corporations likely don't see consumers taking their products seriously until we start climbing into price points that compete with the iPhone and the Galaxy. Um, so in China, if I mean, again, we're because we're talking about different dollar amounts based on conversion or exchange rates, and they can make an argument for a, a one plus that's half the price of an iPhone 10 um after all of the uh, the import taxes and fees and subsidies and stuff so i guess that kind of makes sense our phone is just as good and it's only half the price look at what a great comparison we have against a galaxy s9 or an iphone 10. Yeah. if that i guess that's a true, fair local argument that, a fair that's local a... argument if that holds true where they don't alter the pricing significantly so again if OnePlus arrives costing half of what an iPhone 10 costs, then we're all going to be fine. You know, we're still in that five to six hundred dollar price tag. Um, if if it's if it's significantly more than that, or or if they're only going after some sort of premium or high end variant of the i uh, of the OnePlus Six, I think they're going to have a hard time with the echo chamber of tech enthusiasts. But I don't think they're going to be wrong for general consumers. Just like Google with moving from the Pixel, go, moving from the Nexus to the Pixel, I think consumers started taking the Pixel more seriously than the Nexus because Google got rid of the branding of other manufacturers and they would walk into a Verizon store and see a Pixel from Google. It's the Google iPhone and it costs the same as an iPhone, so it must be just as good as an iPhone and it's Google's iPhone. And I think that psychology goes a long way towards some of these decisions. If a consumer out there wants something different and they see the OnePlus brand and they see all of the goodwill that the OnePlus brand has built with enthusiasts in the space up to this point, and they see it costs the same as an iPhone and it's it's probably even better than an iPhone and it offers all this cool tech, I think that's actually probably the right market position for OnePlus to start making this transition at, even if it's going to frustrate a lot of the people who were earlier adopters of the OnePlus brand and were fans of what OnePlus offered from a bang for buck uh, conversation. So OnePlus still has a relatively limited retail footprint. It relies, mm -hmm. it doesn't even rely on, you know, uh, local regional retailers that much. Uh, in India, it does do the Amazon Flipkart thing, but uh, it, it sells direct to consumer and you know that's part of building the relationship with the consumer, but it's also more of the follies of uh, you know you don't have as much weight to throw around. You can't just go to Google. Uh, you can't just go be Google and go to Verizon and say, okay, this, this is our phone and this is great. And Verizon takes a lot of you know weight into that and goes and and like goes and sells your phone for you. you OnePlus doesn't what? can't do that yet. It's uh, and it does have a few carrier deals uh, around uh, like O2 or Telefonica or something like that. It does like a couple of those, but it doesn't have them in the places that really uh, are, are matter yet. And not even in China, I think with the, but, but um, I can see one plus because one plus I think is, is this arm of Oppo that is more focused on a Western mentality than an Eastern mentality. It's a, you know, like when we check out the difference between a one plus five and an uh, Oppo R series, um, but that's good. That's only going to get you as far as Europe. If if the well, U.S. No, government that's, that's, is going to be like all crazy about Chinese cybersecurity, oh, see, the U.S. government isn't all crazy about Chinese brands. The U.S. government's sure. crazy about Chinese brands that have infrastructure deals, not Chinese brands oh, yeah, that sell that, a lot well, of consumer yeah. data. Because the China, the American government did not get pissy with Lenovo, and they didn't get pissy with OnePlus when they went through some very serious data breaches. Um, those products right. are still fine, but OnePlus and Lenovo don't have designs on the backbone of 5G uh, wireless connectivity in the United States. So they've got issues. Um, so ZTE, let's let's really hammer ZTE because we all know what a juggernaut they are in phone sales in the United States. Um, what, what I could see is maybe a two to three year play for OnePlus. You start shifting the brand to represent more of a premium name in the market. 
you along with that change because you're charging more for the product if you find traction with consumers at that price point at that higher price point through word of mouth advertising you have a better faith argument for local advertising in the united states and at that same time i think when the margins on the phone are higher you can make more of a push towards getting a, a relationship or a partnership with a carrier like t-mobile i think that could be a two or three generation phone plan from from one plus you find some traction, you start heating up the market for a premium option. We're OnePlus. We used to totally make this argument about bang for buck, but you know, for the same price, we can offer a lot more in your flagship, you know, than what you'll get from a Samsung or what you'll get from an Apple. And then you can court some kind of floor space opposite, you know, an LG or an HTC or a Motorola. That OnePlus will look more exciting in a T-Mobile store for what they have to offer in the conversation surrounding the brand. It doesn't happen right away. It definitely doesn't happen uh, with a $750 OnePlus 6. Oh, no. But by the time we get to a OnePlus 8, I think you could sow the seeds for great carrier relationship and uh, a more premium label uh, for consumers to interact with. I don't know how I feel about it because OnePlus, like I consider the OnePlus 1 and OnePlus 2X, um, to be like the freshman years and then from the one plus three onwards we had the unified the um, freaking design language of the phone and it just you know things were getting on a little bit better and mm -hmm. we're, and if you consider that if you take my premise here then we're already considered to be gen three of this sophomoric one plus uh going on here and it's like yeah. i'm wondering i'm just wondering when it when that gets to evolve into something else and when that actually means something for them. And now, like, I mean, I could finish that thought, but there's also like this, this thought in my head where it's like, yeah, we also have to take the current political environment where, and I hate to do this, but like President Donald Trump is calling for a trade war with China and the, yeah. the, the ripple effects of all this could just run around one plus anyways or oppo or anyone else so this is especially a fractious kind of um um time to be talking about one plus hiking up prices this conversation is unique to one plus i mean when we see what what one plus did with some of the manufacturing acumen of oppo you're absolutely right. So like the early days, we were a ton of teething pains and I was not a fan of this company in the OnePlus yeah. One and OnePlus X era. But that transition from the three to the three T, I think we saw a company that had realized it had peaked at what it could offer in the original conversation it set out to have as being the flagship killer and shifting their marketing from flagship killing to never settling. And the OnePlus 5, I think, represents the beginnings of that shift towards something a bit more mass market. Oppo also utilizing their frame for the OnePlus 5 is a very iPhone-y clone, whereas the OnePlus 3, I think, borrowed more influence from HTC design, classic HTC design. So they're already, they were already shifting what the public perception of their brand was going to try and offer. And at the same time, while we do see a lot of government pressure and a lot of influence from like the Trump administration over business sectors, Broadcom, Intel, Qualcomm, what we talked about last week, and then uh, other you know issues that we're seeing with law enforcement uh, initiatives against ZTE and Huawei, we're still hearing conversations about companies like Xiaomi trying to get into the United States too. I this is my hypothesis. This is my guess. I, I, I don't feel that there's good evidence one way or the other when it comes to this administration as to what the rational plan might be between what companies get favored uh, status and what companies get hammered. Um, but because a company like Xiaomi or a company like Oppo or OnePlus isn't trying to make a play for infrastructure, I don't think they're going to face nearly the kind of scrutiny that Huawei has. I think they're going to slip under the radar. They can probably build up some kind of better relationship with retailers. Maybe OnePlus fills up some of the space that we'll talk about later when we talk about Huawei on store shelves at Best Buy or Target. And then those companies get to sell products directly, get the benefit of having some kind of carrier relationship deal because no one's afraid of OnePlus also selling 5G cell towers. And because of that, I think they'll get to sneak in, whereas ZTE is going to get 
is going to get punched in the face. So that that's my guess is I, I think we'll actually see Xiaomi and OnePlus over the next three years make more of a target for American consumers. Well, they do say in Chinese that uh, the word for crisis is the same as opportunity. So uh, <laughs> definitely looking into that um, from uh, Das Otter. So is OnePlus aiming to be a premium brand? Uh, comp uh, parent company BBK is pushing brands like Vivo or Oppo as a replacement for OnePlus, and I don't necessarily think so because OnePlus is their external thing going on for the rest of the world, whereas Oppo and Vivo, more of the Asia sphere, or even like vaguely into Europe, and not that, not quite. So, I mean, it's a they have different branches, and I think they're using them to the optimal. Um, position that they can put them in. Uh, David Batista de Silva, in Europe, their chances, OnePlus's chances, will decrease as the price goes up, especially when they've already been kicked to the curb by Nokia using a similar strategy, where they're going for cut price, but high quality kind of hardware going on. And the software is pretty darn good. So it's, it's Which, to David Batista's point, might mean going upscale could be a smarter play if you can escape nokia competition in europe by making a product that is supposedly nicer than a majority of the nokia phones that'll be sold you get to avoid some of that comparison against one of the most beloved brand names of all time and at the same time you get to pad your margins better so if the company's making more money on fewer phones sold then that's still a win for a, a small little upstart <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Ronaldo Laporte, you know, great point here. The quote unquote, we're just a small team excuse won't cut it anymore. They've been talking about how they've built up their customer yeah. support teams. And it's like, okay, now at some point you have to admit that uh, you have a certain amount of clout. You can't be in the at the kids' table, uh, but you still can't be at like the banquets over no the totally. and, and the there are those recording. infrastructure sort of uh criticisms to levy at a number of companies too uh you know when iphones have problems i think we're willing to forgive an initial batch of phones that have issues because we're pretty confident that apple's going to iterate or improve or at least try to work with consumers but that's not to say that iphones don't have issues i mean almost every major generational shift of iphone has had some kind of major problem, which is then fixed by the S model of the phone, which comes out a year later. So if a OnePlus is trying to make the same play or make the same argument, it's not so much that I can't, I, I, I can't accept that their phones won't occasionally have issues. It's that I need to see that this team can iterate, can improve, can support, and can replace product very aggressively. And that's something that they've been hiding. I think the, one of the points they've been hiding behind there, we're just a tiny little upstart team the most, is some of the delay in fixing some of those issues and some of the messaging that they have when we have concerns over things like data privacy. Oh, it was just a goof, you know, or, oh, just a mistake, or, oh, this wasn't what we intended, or just people didn't understand what this program was. That that's the kind of stuff that I think could could potentially burn the brand, you know. And every time we have like a story like, oh, OnePlus is engaging in benchmark rigging, it chips away at the image of a company. And image is everything when you're trying to make the emotional plea for why your phone costs almost eight hundred dollars. That's not really the rational part of the consumer brain that you're trying to reach. It's the emotional part yeah. of the consumer brain that you're trying to reach. Indeed, indeed. I think we're going to take a break after this uh, next story here, just because like there's a whole oh, bunch of stuff. Like, all right, and like our sponsor and stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should probably talk about them. Yeah, eventually at some next. point, you know, we've been talking about some substantial uh, things, but uh, let's get to uh, Qualcomm and the the because um, we had a we had to play a bit of politics uh, in the back okay. end, uh, uh, talking about uh, their comments to Tech Radar about foldable phones um now like we've been talking about like samsung is probably the highest profile name with its galaxy x uh project that we've uh, uh, you know talked about for a long time but essentially like putting that point like galaxy s x for you know seo purposes and qualcomm <laughs> says oh right. conclusion about foldable phones is not a very hot thing and they're they're trying not to you know 
uh, put water on a fire that everyone wants to see grow. So um, I'll just give you a few choice uh, highlights from this uh, interview with uh, Salman mm -hmm. Saeed, who is product manager at Qualcomm of Display Technology. I'm gonna say that right there. So phone manufacturers haven't really cracked the material science right now to produce electrodes that can repeatedly withstand bending and folding. That's one quote. In regards to the ZTE Axon M, with its uh, rigid uh, screens folding on a hinge, um, trying to fill the void uh, between now and whenever the first foldable comes out, uh, he says that it looks a little ugly. The use cases are pretty bad. The second display does practically nothing, but I think it's compelling. And he okay. kind of ties that up to the next quote here. If you look at what Samsung and this is where we get ideas of the X, uh, Galaxy X. If you look at what Samsung has done with the Snapdragon 835, the S8, the S7, with uh, the DeX, the desktop experience stations, are chips that can power two, three, four displays at the same time. So, yeah, we're underutilized right now in terms of silicon power to uh, display capabilities. We have the GPU horsepower. We have everything needed to fully power all of these extra pixels. So... Big question here. Rigid multiple dis displays, if you can fold them up and, you know, get them into a compact form factor, that'd be a bonus. But do you think that's um, the current, That's the that would be a su substitution right now for foldable displays or for more, you know, real estate? No, I, I really hope it's a place that we don't live in for very long. I, I really like some of the imagination and some of the execution on these experimental almost prototype style phone designs i just don't see what problems they currently solve and also i mean this is one of the things i'm hoping from android p is that android p is smart enough to better utilize differing screen resolutions for me i'm hoping that android is better able to utilize different screen shapes and resolutions and shift between different uh, screen resolutions, not for foldable or flip out screens, but to connect other devices to my phone. So the whole quote about, you know, we're totally underutilizing the power of our phones. I don't think at any other time for general consumers, have they been way over buying for their phones than over the last year? Um, I, I did a segment on Newegg uh, yesterday talking about mobile video production and a very good reason for why you might want a high-end flagship phone, the chipset that goes into that, you're talking about, you know, not only shooting 4K video, that's actually not that intensive anymore. A Qualcomm 630 can easily handle a decent bit rate for capturing 4K video. But on the back end, being able to edit very quickly, see a timeline with multiple tracks of 4K video, and some of it from 100 megabit video files from my Panasonic, and then take that and render in a reasonable amount of time a new 4K video file of reasonably high bitrate quality. That's actually starting to tax the hardware, and we still have plenty of headroom on top of that. So for a lot of consumers out there that just want the nicest, fanciest phone, and it's really expensive, and it's really pretty, and it's got a glass back, and you know they kind of check their Facebook, and they kind of check their email, they have grossly overpurchased. <laughs> In terms of hardware and capabilities, what it is that they're actually getting out of that. It's like the joke that we used to make about IMAX being Facebook browsing machines. You know, you could get this beautiful, really high end, powerful, all in one, gorgeous display IMAX. And then you're basically just using it for its web browser is kind of a shame. You, you, you didn't need to do that, but it felt good. It was really emotionally satisfying and it's really pretty. So that that's great, but you didn't need to spend three grand to to have that you know the actual practical experience from that hardware. So I I really hope we're not going to spend a lot of time messing with increasingly more expensive and more fragile devices that probably have to make compromises for things like battery because you know how do you bend or fold or flip a phone in the same pocketable space that we currently have and include larger batteries. Cause I think a lot of us would, would like to have better battery tech, not smaller battery tech. And at the same time, we could be better utilizing the chipsets that are in our phones. A Qualcomm 845 connected to an external display that can not only mirror the display, but extend the Android desktop. 
would be phenomenal for people who really are starting to exercise and utilize the horsepower of that phone or a phone that could dual boot between Android and Windows 10. Now that Windows 10 has better support for ARM chipsets, you know, you can make much better good faith arguments for leaving laptops at home and powering the stuff off of universal connectors, USB ports, external GPUs, uh, displays that can interact in more of a laptop style form factor or more of a touchscreen style form factor and not be stuck with a proprietary solution that's only going to work for one phone generation. So that's what I'm hoping to see is if Android P can recognize, oh, well, your main phone screen is 2880 by 1440, but you just hooked me up to a 4K display. Do you want to use this 4K display as a mirror for your phone screen? Or do you want to use this 4K display as an extra space? that you can put other apps on or, you know, watch video on. And I'll, you know, I can make that choice as a consumer is way more useful to me than having the back of my phone also be a screen that sometimes I can use, but most of the time I can't. A couple more comments here, Dust Otter. We need experimental phones to exist just so that we can get ex uh, variation in design well, and that's, that's stretch totally minds of the hardware and, and it, R and D team. That's what the, the executive from Qualcomm is saying is a compelling, you, you pick up a, an Axon M and it's really compelling. They're, they're, it, I think it's the, the, the most beautiful design implementation or execution, I should say, the most beautiful design execution for what I don't think is a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and, I, and, I, and I, I hate to phrase it that way because I'm a fan of ZTE and I desperately want to see an Axon 7 follow-up. That to me- It would be a good design, but you know, when you're basing that off of a bad idea, it's kind of, what's the point of the design? And, and again, an idea that's just ahead of its time in that Android is not smart enough to handle extra screen real estate. You have to manually tell the phone that the, the, the other display exists. And I don't think that's a good place for a consumer to be. And that also means that you had to make other compromises. That hinge, the extra display, the, the hardware, which is beautifully machined. It is a gorgeously pieced together phone. Me meant that they had to make compromises on things like chipset. So while we're out here talking about foldable displays with Qualcomm 835s and 845s, the Axon M has to join the conversation at the end of 2017 with a Qualcomm 821. You know, that's that's tough because you're paying for something. So you're paying for this hinge, which is beautifully engineered, but not very well incorporated into the Android ecosystem. And you then as a consumer have to sacrifice the horsepower that you would have hoped to have had from a modern 2017 end of 2017 phone at that price tag. So that that's where I'm not sold on dual screen, rigid dual screen or foldable displays. I don't think they solve enough consumer problems to warrant the extra compromises and the extra costs associated with making them durable enough for lifestyle abuse. And one more comment here before we take a break. And uh, you did mention a few times about uh, the overpurchase of uh, the power of smartphones. Yeah. Uh, from Clinton Roach, uh, another meaning of overpurchase. I've spent about $1,800 on phones this year. The S8 Plus, Note 8, and the Pixel 2 XL. So um, <laughs> congratulations to our big spender club today for uh, being able to... Uh, we need to have like, that. like a ribbon that we can send him, like the, per, per, the best participation trophy. Congratulations from Pocket Now and the Pocket well, and, Now Weekly. And, and that's that's kind of one of the things that I was touching on uh, yesterday for Newegg, too, is we've got these insanely powerful Pocket computers. And I don't think we, I mean, we in the tech journalism industry, but then also definitely more on the manufacturing side, the the, the companies that actually make these products have done a very good job educating general consumers as to what some of the capabilities of these devices might be. Um, I, I know I've mentioned it before on this podcast, but when my when my little sister uh, graduated college with her PhD, uh, we went to the graduation ceremony, we saw her walk, and with uh, at the time I had an LG G6. So an LG G6 with a Qualcomm 821, I shot video, recorded a choir singing their alma mater, got decently zoomed in video footage of her walking across the stage, panning through the audience, you know, family members crying in our little row of seats from her getting her diploma. And before the rest of the graduation ceremony was done, and before we were able to meet back up with my sister, I had edited and rendered a new 4K video 
of the graduation ceremony, all shot at the graduation ceremony, all from a phone. You know, I, I think there are numerous people out there above and beyond what like Apple can do with iMovie who would definitely benefit and appreciate some of these tools and the fact that they are substantially powerful mobile production tools, even if they don't get the full use out of them, I don't think they even realize that they can do half as much as what you actually can from these phones. Instead, we're just sort of more impressed by like, oh, you know, I can open a Facebook app a, a fraction of a millisecond faster than I could last year. So that's that's pretty nifty. I, I don't really think that's moving the passion on incorporating this tech into our daily lives as much as it is just sort of, again, an, an additional distraction for what's the most expensive phone, what's the most popular phone, what's the prettiest phone, cool. And then we just kind of get stuck there for future phone iterations because that's what sells. What is the true value of a smartphone these days? That's what we want to ask. And uh, we're going to keep asking those questions, uh, but we'll take a few uh, seconds here to uh, talk about our sponsor. Yes. And our sponsor this week uh, is uh, the Google Cloud Platform. Are you looking to move to the cloud? Do you not know where to begin? Check out the Google Cloud Platform weekly podcast where Google developer advocates Melanie Warwick and Mark Mandel answer questions, get in the weeds, and talk to the GCP teams, customers, and partners about best practices. From security to machine learning and more, hear from technologists all across Google about trends and cool things happening with our technology. You can click to learn more and subscribe to the podcast at g.co slash GCP podcast. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. And uh, we are back with uh, more news, more views, more interesting things. And uh, there's, a, there's a conversation brewing over in our YouTube chat about one of our big stories uh, for the back half here. But I want to get back on the train here, discuss um, something that Apple Apple seems to be always in the state of flex in software. <laughs> it feels like, like right. it never seems to be like I also uh, I like today, um, or la actually last night I was uh, rewatching the freaking what was it the unlock ad where it features the the girl uh, using the iPhone tens face ID and then it's like she's walking throughout the school unlocking lockers staring yeah, it's at it's like, a cute spot speakers. though I mean again I it's think Apple Apple makes uh I I adore Apple's marketing for coming up with fun and novel ways to showcase one individual feature and it's oh, that did nothing for me that did nothing for me it, it's not for me you know what I mean like but I totally so so like I always point to the water resistance ad for the iPhone seven, you know, ACDC playing thunder as this bicyclist is about to go out in torrential downpour, but he's OK because his iPhone's now water resistant. That was an ad for me. That was a baller ad. But this one, the whole face unlock ad, it doesn't do anything for me. And also, I'm just not personally that impressed. Yeah, I'm 23 it. years old. It doesn't do anything for me. It's like, it's nothing cool. It's like, oh, it's not, it just shows flying beakers or whatnot and not like Facebook <laughs> posts and, and other well, no, things that would be more what new. What that, though, is, is I think that that ad is going to emotionally resonate with someone who will think that that's cool. You know, there is someone who's using maybe like an iPhone 6 and the idea of just holding up their phone to their face and watching it unlock is going to be a fun feature for them to incorporate in the way that they use their phone. And I think Apple does a very good job of tapping into the feels for the person who's likely to find an ad like that motivating. I'll happily consume that Apple ad as opposed to the what's a computer iPad ad, which <laughs> makes like because they're not even millennials and like we're making fun of the generation coming after millennials now before they even had a chance to name themselves and 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 that is just the most reductive view of what future tech integration and communication is going to not to make like. everything about the concept of the ads and the actual execution of the ads themselves uh, we've been really rambly it's a, it's the good kind of rambly but we eventually but, we have but to go on your your the point you were trying to accomplish the bug the notification notification bug where it's a it's a vanity oh, bug it's something right yeah like it, but like it shows the no like the message notification text but you know it's like it, it, it's hidden and then once you unlock it it should expand to read out the contents but right. it, it's like it like it doesn't properly do so like the text appears outside the bounding box uh for a second so that was in the first version of the ad guess what they had a second version of the ad 
all the same things, but that one shot was replaced with something that that had to be either computer generated. It was like a different shot, and it like it featured the freaking notification box properly, you know, fading in the text without you know having it appear outside the box, which is kind of in the apples in its own fantasy world for a second here because that hasn't been fixed in the real world just yet but um one interesting thing i should note is that the youtube video like they posted it on youtube it still has the original views it still has the original freaking um publication date and whatnot and uh so yeah they, they just got their privilege you know shown off <laughs> kind of thing. they're well, able to I mean, substitute don't, files don't believe that they have a beta version of ios that fixes that problem that they were showing off on on camera that, that know, this could will be. be a fix coming to all iphones next week you, you don't think that that's what could have happened it's the magic of marketing man i i don't know what you're talking about uh speaking of marketing verizon it's uh, it's been yeah. doing its own marketing um now i should say is it's not just about the galaxy s9 showing up as an add-on as a push notification on iphones it's just the whole attitude towards oh hey let us mark direct market you something via push notification when apple clearly states that you sh we shouldn't be direct marketing you anything through push notifications and we're just going to do this anyways and apparently this uh, behavior has been allowed for so long well, I mean, at some point, the ultimate kind of irony, the ultimate slap in the face had to <laughs> happen. Like, really? I, Seriously? Well, but, you know, it, it is... I, I can appreciate where it's definitely got to be upsetting for iPhone owners, though, because these rules seem to be very inconsistently applied to certain brands over other brands. And, and iOS the developers, for God's sakes. <laughs> oh, no, exactly. That's what I mean, is like... There, there are certain guidelines and, and rules that you have to participate to to use a walled garden app ecosystem and apples are pretty strict unless you're a major carrier like verizon and then well we'll kind of turn a blind eye to that um we we're gonna have difficulties i think over over the next couple of years as we sort out you know sort of the impact of a near monopolistic approach to uh, consumer information and how companies can leverage user data what they have access to and what they can also put in front of our faces on the products that we kind of own but don't completely own even though we bought them and this is definitely something that i think deserves uh, some scrutiny or some ire from people who are tapped into that ios ecosystem because apple also makes a ton of messaging about how they don't I mean, you're not buying a Google product, so your information isn't being used for marketing and advertising. We're Apple. We're better than that. And we don't turn our users into beta testers. We don't we don't turn our user info into marketing, marketing analytic analytics data to be sold. But here's an ad from Verizon <laughs> right in your face. I, I mean, that's 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 a tough spot to have both ideas sort of running simultaneously through an iOS fan. Uh, iOS fans mind and I I'm sure that has to cause some disruption and this tweet uh, from Nick Korn who's uh, isn't participating in our particular conversation but he tweeted at the time uh, in response to the original post that's showing off this little little oddity uh, that he's tweeted Apple and Verizon about this multiple times they require notifications to use their data view widget which is such a BS practice Apple clearly doesn't care enough to enforce their rules for certain players, but don't put a calculator in your widget or reject it. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think he's uh, more uh, more impassioned, uh, more emotionally making kind of the same argument that I was. I, you know, it, it's it's all well and good to have a mysterious black box of approvals. It's a bunch of the concerns that I've had with Google on YouTube as a platform, Apple with their App Store as a platform. Um, numerous other cases and instances yeah. far too many for us to go through in any sort of meaningful but fashion but you can't see the hands of the overlord that you're serving so yeah and and you also don't know when you've screwed up until afterwards and then you have to like beg for forgiveness there's no after action there's no good accounting there's no there's no way to sort of head off some of these concerns beforehand unless you're somehow a major force that apple doesn't want to fight so really, it's just you have to be too big to fail. 
once you're too big to fail, yeah. then <laughs> Apple won't enforce any of their policy on you. Um, they'll they'll just spend all of their time and energy going after smaller developers and players or in the market. Maybe like for their ads where they show the carrier's logo for one second. It's just like we're not gonna put your logo ever again on, on our ads. So I don't know. <sighs> Something like that. All right. Like um that. and uh, let's uh finish off here with Instagram. Uh, one of the constant um, pet peeves of everyone that likes to see up-to-date posts and not <laughs> post from like five days ago. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're finally like, and this is news coming off of uh, other stuff happening at Facebook. I don't particularly know what's going on with that. I do, but I, I, for this, the purposes of this podcast, I, I'll just be willfully, blissfully ignorant of it. But Fair enough. Well, it's, yeah, but Instagram, hey, look at that. It's this Facebook-owned entity that's actually doing the right thing that people have been asking for. So about time, finally. Well, I mean, we should probably tell people what it is, is, is you know, cultivating oh, yeah, that's right. content, going time. through algorithms. What Facebook started doing was making it ever more painful to get to just a chronological view of your timeline. And they started trying to really manufacture uh, uh, how long can you keep a viewer's eyeballs on the screen? So when you exhaust the most recent updates from your chronological view, people will leave Facebook. So what Facebook started doing was really manufacturing uh, posts out of chronological order in a way that would try and keep people more engaged with the platform for longer and longer periods of time. It's a really sort of insidious digital junkie mentality for uh for social media. So with Instagram under the Facebook umbrella, they started doing the same thing to the timeline for Instagram. This metaphor doesn't work very well. Cultivating content in a way that Instagram algorithms thinks is going to engage more with people um, because of, I think, sort of the Twitter effect for how Instagram is used. If you you post something to Instagram and it's fairly timely, you want people to interact with it in a fairly narrow time frame. And yeah. also it feels really creeper to go back through someone's timeline and start interacting with posts from a week or more ago. So I think yeah. this is I think this is an acknowledgement that this plan probably did not have the desired effect at Instagram. If People complained about it, but we're using Instagram more. Instagram wouldn't be changing to have Instagram be used less, right? No, no one, no one says like, "Oh, hey, people are using our service a ton more, and we're seeing much better interaction with sponsored posts. We're making more money." Oh, but the, a few people are loudly complaining about not having chronology view. So let's go back to that. No, no corporation would ever do that. Oh, I no. really do believe that this user backlash isn't just a vocal minority who are loudly complaining, I think this had a negative impact on the usage of Instagram. And now they're recovering to try and go back to something that's a bit more timely. I know I'm looking over my own stats on what apps I use. My usage of Instagram has curtailed significantly since these changes went into place. And there was no conscious design on that. It wasn't that they did this and I thought to myself, well, that does it, I'm gonna stop using Instagram as much. I've just naturally not been interested in what photos my friends have posted last week. And if I don't have sort of a, a, a safe feeling that I'm interacting in the moment with people who are sharing content, because I, I follow a lot of really great photographers, but I want to see what they're doing right now. I don't care about what they did three or four days ago. They don't care about what I did three or four days ago. We're just not interacting with each other. We're talking past each other because of an algorithm that holds our, our content for a week. So while it's great that they're going to try and make this more timely, I think Instagram's best play would be go back to a chronological view or at least give us the option buried deep in the settings to go back to a chronological view because I think that's going to be the best way to maximize the interactions on Instagram. I posted this photo. I'm actually still on the photo. You drop me a comment in the time that I'm still on my photo, we'll have a conversation. If you drop me a comment on a photo that I posted like a week ago, I don't know that I'm really going to engage. I don't know that I'm really going to spend a lot of time on that conversation. Well, it's it's a very complex formula of, you know, choosing your favorite subjects or subject matter 
and then applying the timeliness uh, factor to it. And you know, that's what we prioritize every time we hit head on the freaking app. Now we well, can follow and, hashtags and, about, and we can follow people. Yeah. Think, think, think about how much work goes into all of that algorithm, which is still going to be inferior for for yeah. true interactions for a lot of people. It's still going to be inferior to just what's the date and the time. Okay, order it that way. <laughs> you know? Like all of this timeliness stuff and, and like manipulating our feed in any way is inferior to chronological view and is, is more difficult to execute and is still going to rub people the wrong way for how they want to interact and communicate with their favorite uh, Instagram accounts. It's, hey, here, it's here's a lose-lose. Yeah, here's this friend that you like you sort of get, get in contact with every so often, and uh, they just had a birthday party, but you didn't know about it until three days after their birthday party. <laughs> after, so. Congratulations, uh, Instagram. You still fail yeah. at life. Love one. Mm -hmm. Well, at least they're they're going to try and put in some regramming, native regramming stuff into their app now. So that's great, right? <laughs> I I I guess I don't Maybe. know. I, yeah. I you know again, it's the Facebook landed a coup with Instagram in a platform that they could use to beg, borrow, and piecemeal out services that they couldn't acquire. You know, like using Instagram as the best leverage against Snapchat, for example, was a genius move. Um, where it goes from there, I, I, I don't know. And especially what was some of the backlash and the ire that we've seen with Facebook recently, I think they're going to be putting more pressure on Instagram to perform because of the different splits of audiences that are starting to cool off on using Facebook as a main platform. You can move them to another service. You can kind of keep them in the Facebook ecosystem to some degree. Uh, I, I think that's probably why they're reacting the way they are. If you're nervous about Facebook not having the same kind of brand engagement, and then you're starting to see that the algorithm changes you made to Instagram are starting to chill some of the user base there, I would be terrified. After watching Snapchat fall apart, if if an Instagram-like service started to fall apart, that would be terrible. Yeah. So yeah, I would be backpedaling super fast to try and get people back into heavy use on Instagram like I used to be. Uh, Instagram used to be something that was almost always up on my phone screen, just kind of padding through, stuck in a grocery line store, waiting to check out, like it's kind of flipping through a couple Instagram posts. And now I, I don't touch it nearly as often. I don't touch it nearly like I used to. Yeah. And uh, finally, lots of uh, things going on here with uh, this uh, story. And it has definitely sparked a conversation in both our feeds uh, with uh, Huawei talking about Best Buy and uh, or not not well, it's people talking about Best Buy ditching Huawei and Huawei saying that it's still friends with Best Buy. So, oh <laughs> uh, boy. Um, so I mean, I'm getting a lot of um, comments here about talking about how other countries are starting to look into um, uh, their concerns about Huawei or Chinese manufacturers getting into their grids for 5G, like Canada and uh, the UK and uh, a lot of uh, Europe. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's the, again, that's the specter that we're going behind here that China using, you know, its uh, commercial properties, being able to influence what's going on with the telecoms grid for the countries that it does business with. And that's right. apparently a big cybersecurity threat. That's the, that's the backdrop. Now, in the foreground, we have the front-end companies like Huawei and ZTE that do both telecoms um, equipment and consumer smartphones and tablets and computers and whatnot. They're not getting picked up by carriers. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been working for the past couple of years to be able to hope to reach uh, carrier status. ZTE did with the Axon M. They're, they're getting sold by AT&T. And literally, at CES... Huawei was like this close to getting to announcing that uh, they were going to be also getting uh, sold. The Mate 10 Pro was going to be sold by AT and T, and also Verizon at one point. But um, you know they pulled back, and there was a lot of DC um, uh, like hullabaloo about oh, it's it, this is uh, China. We still have these ongoing investigations about them breaching sanctions uh, by doing business in Iran, which we don't approve of. And, um, you know, that's why we should keep our eyes on them. And uh, they're, and then the FBI thing, the, the freaking meeting of the six 
intelligence agencies took place. They testified to Congress and said, don't buy ZTE and don't buy Huawei phones ever. So yeah, well, this is this is also, I think, one of the things that's facing because I'm a fan. I'm a fan of the Huawei brand and I'm a fan of ZTE. These are two companies that I very much enjoy the products that they produce. And I'm I'm always looking forward to what they bring to the table because I think they do some really interesting things. Um, my personal bias out of the way, the biggest problem I have with this story is I want to see evidence because if there are concerns, it is partly our platform and partly our voices that need to help spread the word to not only our viewers and our followers of people who find our videos, but then also our family and friends who we've recommended some of these products to. I have a personal stake in this, knowing that I have a few fam family members on honor phones because honor phones are pretty badass, especially if you're looking at that bang for buck ratio. I want to be active in that conversation if there's a there there, if there's an actual issue that warrants our attention. And, and I find this to be phenomenally frustrating to hear advisories, law enforcement advisories against these products, but then not have any evidence. And still to this day, I don't believe we've seen any significant evidence from people that are very good, you know, like white hat style uh, uh, people who like to peek under the hood of gadgets and consumer electronics, also not having found any significant potential for threat, whereas we have faced significant threat from uh from bad actors in in the software space on numerous products in the past i i, I single them out just because i remember them hitting hitting pretty hard but you know uh lenovo uh, uh laptops that had included software before microsoft got really uh hardcore about the signature edition windows uh windows distros um one plus also major data breaches and major problems with how personally identifying information from your phone was being stored on cloud servers in China. Where were our security, uh, you know, where were our security bulletins from law enforcement for those companies? So until I can see some kind, so I feel every country, if the, if the United States law enforcement community is, is issuing advisories against these companies, I totally believe every other company should also be examining the, the retail footprint of a Huawei or a ZTE too. But if there are actual security threats and we don't detail what those threats are to consumers, then I think law enforcement's being negligent in their cybersecurity uh, duties in properly informing the populace on how to protect themselves. And if there aren't, then this is gonna read like the United States government just being overly punitive against the corporate infrastructure sector of these businesses, as opposed to the consumer facing electronics side of these industries. Just like we don't confuse LG displays with LG washers and dryers. They're practically two different companies. <laughs> can, can I can I get you off your soapbox for just a second here, but because I, I, I want to get <laughs> oh well, I want to get into my like the the specifics of Best Buy because like like carriers, basically Huawei never had them, so they they weren't exactly gaining ground, but they weren't losing it either. And with this, with Best Buy, they're losing retail ground. They're losing a retail partner in this, and yeah, like all this stuff about oh, we're going to. Uh, Destock in a few weeks, and then we're not going to order any more Huawei products from MateBooks to tablets to phones to whatnot. That's a, you know that's still we're still seeing Huawei products being sold right now. It's going to take a few weeks, uh, barring a preemptive announcement by Best Buy or Huawei, like indicating that this will be true. Now, in the case of Best Buy and Huawei in, speci in specificity. There could be just a re one big reason why this particular relationship uh, has fallen down, and that was with the Mate 10 Pro. We're going back to that phone because, mm -hmm. uh, as you may recall, a couple of weeks ago, Huawei, uh, or actually like more than a month ago, Huawei initiated a contest uh, for something. Like they were giving away a Mate 10 Pro to a beta testing group yeah. that was like a software testing group or something like that, that it was very confused. Uh, they they themselves admitted, the company admitted that there was yeah, a confluence they, they, of they errors. That, that contest yeah. for leaving reviews on Best Buy. Leaving yeah. reviews of the product on Best Buy while the phone was still in pre-release, while the phone was still in pre-orders. Yeah. So, you know, going back on that and evaluating that as one of the more apparent kind of factors, the, the chips against Huawei, um, it could be just 
a China, yeah, kind of a Chinese I, I, company I, trying to feel out these things. And just I, I can definitely happen. appreciate where that might have contributed because because I, I think that could go hand in hand uh, with Best Buy having an expectation that the Mate 10 Pro was going to end up at at t So Best Buy would have a phone that is also getting some back end support from at t for branding and marketing and being in at t store shelves something that they don't have to do all the legwork for putting the Mate 10 Pro up on its own in-store display, taking up retail floor space. And then they also get this, this problem with Huawei on, uh, you know, playing shenanigans with the uh, product ranking uh, situation at Best Buy. Now, to be fair, Best Buy also had some problems in that you could rate and review products that weren't available to be sold. Um, so, I, you know, they I feel like they also learned something, too, in how they're trying to position themselves as an as a resource for consumers to educate themselves. But I would I would wonder if in the whole grand scheme of mobile market and tablets and laptops and what companies are, are delivering what brands, if that would be enough, if the if the rating uh, contest that Huawei put up and, and I don't think they put it up in good faith, um, if that rating contest would be enough to completely sever Best Buy from one of the world's largest phone and laptop manufacturers, and especially on the eve of the MateBook coming, the new MateBook coming out, which I think could be a really exciting floor model for consumers to check out uh, looking for an alternative to uh, to a MacBook. I, I would wonder if that's not all wrapped up together with maybe pressure from law enforcement, pressure from government on top of some of those shenanigans and Best Buy feeling like they they weren't getting in the Mate 10 what they thought they were. They thought they were getting a carrier supported phone then selling the phone in a Best Buy is way easier than just selling an un unlocked phone in a Best Buy. So I, I think you're right. I think it is multifaceted and there are a lot of prongs going out. It's not just this law enforcement advisory, but I'd still want to see some reporting or some better communication as to what is triggering all of these reactions to Huawei as a brand. And until I see that, I, I don't know that I feel super strongly about avoiding their products. I'm going to be very upset if there is a good reason to avoid their products and they went months without telling us. Um, but then we'll rejoin the conversation and we'll share what that what yeah. those findings are and why people should be concerned. I don't feel people should be concerned now until there's a reason for them to be concerned. In the meantime, if you don't feel any particular loyalty, if you don't have any programs that you know offer you discounts at Best Buy, you do have your alternatives at Amazon, B and H, whatever the heck that you uh, often do. So uh, there is that Andrew Wallace, uh, fat produce on Twitter. Uh, he talked to some Best Buy employees. He was actually formerly Best Buy employee as well uh, a couple hours ago, and they didn't even know about the Huawei uh, destocking in that store until I mentioned it. Um, so uh, there's that. It could be that this is a directive that uh, is uh, being mold upon hasn't left corporate yet like again this is a lot of cnet this is this is like we don't know where their point of entry is in terms of talking about this stuff so yeah. it's it's good it, like this could not pan out at, at all so right uh but it's definitely at the point we're at it's definitely something that we should be concerned about either for huawei or for I don't know the, the our consumers. So, well, and and also, I mean that that's that's kind of where I'm taking this from. Is I have concerns for consumers. We want to see more competition. I think Huawei make phenomenally competitive products, and if there is a concern for consumers, we want to be a resource for people to understand what the potential risks of using a product might be. And it kind of feels like a lot of that information is being held from us, or there isn't really a fire. There's just a lot of smoke. So that, that's that's why I mean we'll probably be covering this as it as it continues to unfold because it's frustrating speculating. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, like we we all want better information as to who we do business with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely a lot to be talking about. Uh, you can see full details on these stories and more. You can hit pocketnow.com on social media as well and look for the podcast section to get the 
this episode's rundown, and you can chat with us about what you have been reading up on as well with hashtag PNWeekly. And also be sure to check out Jaime Rivera and The Pocket Now Daily on our YouTube channel. Uh, definitely lots to be... Uh, this was a chalk chock full week if i do yeah. say so myself and a lot of really interesting news i mean not 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 a heavy week for you know, like hardware announcements but some some really good meaty stories to to dig into and and something i'm going to hopefully be following up on soon too which i mean we didn't talk about but hopefully we can cover when there is more to cover would be the potential partnership between ifttt and ibm watson so i might finally get my watson phone courtesy of if this then that yeah. so you uh, have, you know, have a reason to spout joys about <laughs> exactly. uh, watson for 90 <laughs> minutes straight like they're actually <laughs> trying to to do something with watson for consumers i'm very interested in that conversation too but folks uh there you they'll, have it they'll just do the do my taxes at h and r block that's all that they'll do that's it. Right. Yeah. Hey, IBM Watson, do my taxes. And you just walk away and everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> there you have it, folks. Another episode, the Pocket Now Weekly, come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where Jules is at Point Jules. And I'm humbly at some gadget guy. Pocket Now is around the web Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google, YouTube, our home site, pocketnow.com. And if you speak Spanish, check out es.pocketnow.com. Now, shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews anywhere you can leave a podcast review help us spread the word on chatting technology uh, once again we want to thank this week's sponsor check out the google cloud platform podcast uh, they're helping us keep the lights on here but ultimately there wouldn't be a show without our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012 the pocket now weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness so make sure you tune back in one last word from our sponsor are you looking to move to the cloud? Check out the Google Cloud Platform Weekly Podcast, where Google developer advocates answer questions, get in the weeds, and talk to experts, customers, and partners about GCP. Click to learn more and subscribe to the podcast at g.co slash gcppodcast.